Hello friends and welcome to day 41 of our journey through the Bible. My name is Kenny and I make these videos to try to encourage you to read the scripture and to force myself to think a little more deeply about the passages I'm reading every day. Today we're in Exodus verses 33, or sorry, chapters 33 through 35. And as always in Exodus, there's a lot to unpack here, so I have to pick and choose about a little bit about what we're going to talk about. Now, we'll just start at the very beginning with a statement by God in Exodus 33, verse 1. He says, it says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to you, I will give it to your descendants. And he says he's going to send an angel ahead to uh, to go and uh, and prepare the way and and uh, put fear in the hearts of the people that lived in that land at the time. And then he says in verse 3, Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. <laughs> this is an unexpected statement from God, to, put, to say the least. But what we want to see first here is that God is faithful in, in spite of our unfaithfulness. When I read this passage, the first response is, is, oh my gosh, God is reneging on his promise to be with these people. Shouldn't God just, just fill in their blanks, you know, pick up where he left off, forgive them, and move on? But God is, has been rejected by them. And so he's giving them their choice. He said, look, you're stiff-necked people. You want what you want. Moses, I'm going to fulfill my promise, and I'm going to send you to the promised land. You take them on. I'm going to send an angel to go ahead, but I am not coming personally with you. Now, that's a big statement. There's so much more in there than meets the eye. So let me make a quick practical application on this. We sometimes wonder why God isn't active in our lives or why we don't see him. It's simple. One of the reasons we don't see more of God in our lives is because we don't allow more of God in our lives. It's because we don't allow him to fill us. It's because we want everything we want the way we want it. We want to be disobedient. We want to go against his principles. We want to reject what he says and still expect him to bless us along the way. Now, the wonderful thing about God is, oh my goodness, does he love us in spite of us? The wonderful thing about God is that just like in this situation, God will often provide when we don't deserve it. And praise God, he provides when we don't deserve it. Because the fact is, none of us deserve it. So this story starts off with that, but then it goes on to explain that, that Moses go, has this place he meets with God regularly, and Joshua's there all the time, but it's this tent he goes into to meet with God. And so Moses goes in and he, and he meets with God and he says, God, look, don't leave me with these people and come with me. Go with us. And so and the, the glory of the Lord rests on Moses. And God gives Mo, and, and God relents, basically. God says, okay, look, I will come with you because of you and your faithfulness, Moses. And so, so the glory of the Lord has rested on Moses because Moses has been there with him for so long and his face shines with the glory. And there's this great description <clears throat> of the people's reaction and all of that, to seeing Moses' face glowing and, uh, and all of that. And then, uh, you know, God provides new stone tablets because Moses had broken them because the people were breaking them uh, in the chapters before. Um, and then you see this, in chapter 34, you see this statement. God, in verse 10, says, Then the Lord said, I am making a covenant with you. Speaking directly to Moses. I think this is pretty cool. God has said, look, I'm not going with these stiff-necked people. Moses appeals to God. Moses earns God's favor. And God says, you know what? I'm going to go, but my covenant's going to be with you because you are faithful. If you want to see the maximum blessings from God, if you want to have the maximum experience with God, you have to, you have to be willing to be the kind of person that God would make a covenant with. Now, that doesn't mean you live perfectly. What it means is you continually move in his direction, agree with him, and move in his direction, and repent whenever you do fail. Repentance means agreeing with God that it was wrong and determining to work to do it no more. And notice I say work to do it no more because 
the reality is not everything falls off right away. All our bad habits don't just disappear overnight for most of us. Some people are lucky and that happens, but for most of us, that's not the way it happens. There's always something to be working on in our lives. So God makes his covenant and he says, Before all your people, I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. Obey what I command you today. I will drive out before you the Amorites, etc. And he continues on just to say, say, I will do all of these things. But God gives a standard next for how to have this great relationship with him. Because there, there are some caveats. There are some requirements. It's not just do whatever you want and you have this great relationship with God. No, he tells the people that when they go, he tells Moses to tell the people that when they go into the, the, the land he's being sent to, that they are not to intermingle with the people there. And they're especially not to marry into the people there. And he says it like this. He says, And when you choose some of their daughters as wives for your sons, and those daughters prostitute themselves to their gods, they will lead your sons to do the same. I love the way the scripture is human. It acknowledges our humanity. It'd be very easy to judge these folks, but that would be denying the power of wives. That would be denying what the influence that women have on men. And he's saying to the men here, when you go and you find a wife, find a godly wife. Because that wife who doesn't follow the Lord is going to influence you away from the Lord. Now, some men stand up to that. And praise God for those men. But most men, if we're really honest, are deeply influenced spiritually by our wives instead of the other way around. So, there's wisdom here. There's practical wisdom in these passages. God wants his people to be holy. Holy means separate. God wants his people to go and worship him and him alone. And he's creating boundaries, not to be a cosmic killjoy, but to encourage them and show them the what is what it takes to follow him well. The same is still true today. We've got to put boundaries around our lives if we're going to follow the Lord. Love the people in the world. Love our friends. Love our, uh, our friends who don't know the Lord. But when you're a new Christian, when you're new to trying to walk with the Lord, it is so easy to get drawn into old habits where you're around people that are doing those same old things. And pretty soon, your faith is watered down. You're not walking with the Lord. And you're just spending every day like a regular person, a part of the world, in the world, and of the world. So, so he gives a bunch of rules here. And then as its story goes on, he gives, gives regulations for the Sabbath, talks about a bunch of materials for the tabernacle. And this is where we want to finish up our observations for today. I don't want us to miss the last part of chapter 35. At the end of chapter 35, there's a story of Bezalel and, Aho I don't know how to say this name right, Aholiab. And I got to read this to you because I think this is great. And, and especially, men, if you're watching this, listen up. Then Moses said to the Israelites, See, the Lord has chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom and understanding, with knowledge and with all kinds of skills, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of artistic crafts. And he has given both him and Ohaliab, son of Ahisamach, I'm butchering the names, I apologize, of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach others. He has filled them with the skill to do all kinds of work as engravers, designers and embroiders in blue, purple, and scarlet yarn with fine linen and weavers, all of them skilled workers and designers. So how is this tabernacle going to be built? God gifted people in the arts. Now, in our modern world, men tend not to value the arts as much as we should. People as a whole don't value the arts as much as we should. I think and this is my observation, I, I think that's because the arts in many ways have been perverted out of beauty to hedonism. Instead of representing the most beautiful things of God, they represent hedonistic um, uh, activity. Just think of music, the, the lyrics of modern music. Much of it is either directly hedonistic or it is, um, it is indirectly or alluding to lots of sinful behavior. And that affects our soul. And as, as Christians, it, it, well, there aren't enough Christians out there pushing their art, whether it be music or, um, or, or painting or architecture or crafts or whatever it is. 
we need to be using our skills to bring more beauty into the world. You see, God doesn't call men just to be strong. God doesn't call men to be one-dimensional. He calls men to be multi-dimensional. Some, he makes warriors, strong, determined. Others, he makes artists. But both are in the kingdom of God and both are worthy men. And so I want to end it with that. Just a few thoughts about manhood, quite frankly, and the place of art in, uh, in the church. The church should be a place that is beautiful and as much as we can afford to make it beautiful. So I can go on about that. I hope you've had a good time today in the Word, and may God bless you, and stay in the Word, and we'll see you tomorrow for day 42.